Hello, everyone. Welcome this afternoon. Um, it's my great pleasure uh, to be here with Brandon Rigg, a great friend and a former colleague who is the vice president of Unscripted Originals and Acquisitions at Netflix. Um, Brandon, you're at the most exciting place to be in content right now. So <laughs> tell us how you got here. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to say I'm thrilled to be here. I have not been to the Edinburgh Festival before, and uh, it's just been an amazing day and a half. Uh, so we're excited to be here and sort of talk about Netflix and demystify it a little bit. Um, in terms of how I got to Netflix, when I was in university, I interned at Warner Brothers um, and sort of got my first taste of working in entertainment. I moved to Los Angeles without a job, um, and I got an assistant position at Fox. And sort of, it was right as Unscripted was becoming a thing. Bachelor was rolling out, um, Survivor was coming out, and I sort of was drawn to that genre. So I began going down that path. And from there, I went to a studio uh, at Carsey Warner. Um, and then I actually switched over to the production side. And uh, I started out as a PA on a surfing show that Mark Burnett was doing. Uh, and I joke, if there were 100 people on that crew, I was the 100th most important person. Um, and I did everything from sweeping up the production office to getting people to sign releases when you'd shoot them in the stands, which is the least glamorous job. Um, but it was the best job that I'd had, and I really knew that I wanted to do that uh, for my career. Um, so I came back, I was a story editor. I used to get notes and posts from the network and go, oh, these guys don't know anything. They're asking ridiculous notes. Um, and decided I'd really be interested in exploring the network side. So I went from Burnett to VH1, and while I was there, um, continued to do unscripted programming. Um, we had Surreal Life back then. I helped develop a show called Breaking Bonaducci. Um, and then, uh, as fate would have it, I ended up joining ABC after three years at VH1. Um, I had an amazing time there and got to work on some of the biggest shows that we had, uh, Dancing with the Stars, or, or Strictly, as you'd call it, Extreme Makeover Home Edition, Wipeout, Wife Swap, um, and after four years, went to NBC, where I was for about six plus years, working on everything from Got Talent to Ninja Warrior, uh, The Voice, uh, a, a whole slew of shows, Biggest Loser, so really a lot more big, big format shows. I left there at the end of 2016 as Netflix was starting an unscripted division, uh, and so I've been there for a little under two years now. Yeah. It's very exciting. So uh, before we uh, play the sizzle, let me just let everyone know that we'll spend maybe 15 minutes at the end with qu uh, answering questions. So send your questions, any that you have, into the Netflix app. Okay, so let's play the um, unscripted sizzle reel for Netflix. What is unscripted for Netflix? So unscripted, I think as we all know here, is really, I'd argue, probably the most diverse content genre. Right? It's everything from talk shows to game shows to performance shows to factual series. And really, Netflix is trying to do all of those shows. And we're trying to do the sort of best in class for all those categories. So you know, we, we strive to tell stories globally. You know, it's not just US stories or English speaking stories, but from around the world. Um, and we're looking really for every category that we would talk about here. Uh, music shows, property shows, car shows, uh, makeover shows. Um, we have our docs team as well, um, mm -hmm. which they focus in an amazing way on sort of that documentary storytelling. Um, but for Unscripted, it's really about achieving sort of the big, big scale shows and then the shows that are maybe a more niche in nature, but that people really love because of the subject matter that they follow. So just elaborate a little bit more on the documentary side. So how, how does someone know who to pitch to, whether it's you or the, or the docs team? Yeah. It's a fair question. We, we do get that a lot. Um, so the docs team really, I think, they work with filmmakers that have a passion for telling a particular story and tell it through a particular POV. Um, and they do an amazing job with it. We love working alongside them. Uh, and we sort of stay in constant communication with them in terms of what they're doing and what we're doing. I'd say that of the breadth of stuff that Unscripted does, it's really 10% that you could argue maybe overlaps a bit with docs, and most of that really is the factual series type swings. Um, we lean a little more maybe into an entertainment-centric approach, um, but at the end of the day, you can really come to either department, and if we think it's a better fit with, with docs or vice versa, we sort of share the project with them. Um, but at the end of the day, it really is about getting the best stories and the best programs on our service, so it doesn't matter who it comes through. 
Great. And so I know your portfolio includes 100% originals, co-pros, and acquisitions. So talk about right. that. Sure. Um, and this, I think, really is the, the thing we're most excited about at Netflix in terms of coming here. Um, just as a, a quick sort of tangent, in the last sort of two days, meeting with a lot of the producers here and production companies, what was most revealing to me is that there feels like there was a little bit of um, confusion in terms of coming to Netflix on the unscripted space, which really was something that we were not as aware of, because we are working with a ton of talented British showrunners and UK production companies, and we want to continue doing that and growing that. And this is really an opportunity for us to reach out to the community here and say, we want your stories, we want those projects to come in to us. Um, but in terms, of, in terms of the three pillars, if you will, of unscripted, so we have original commissions, which I think we all you know, understand that. That's sort of the bread and butter of coming to us with, with an original idea that we would do globally as an exclusive. Um, Co-pros is, is a model that I don't think as many people know about, um, but which we really love and are excited about, particularly with the UK. And that's essentially, we have a department within Unscripted that focuses on working with the UK broadcasters and the UK production companies. Typically, we fund a third or so of a project um, it allows the creators to sort of, I think, achieve either the vision they have for the show or allows the, the networks out here to engage with the show um, and help with the budget, with our funding. Once we commit to that setup, it'll air here in the UK, first run in the home territory, wherever the home territory is. Um, we'll have a second window following that run. And then outside of the home territory, we sort of have our first run globally. Um, so it's, it's sort of a win-win. It, it allows, I think, producers to scale in terms of volume, to get the shows they're most passionate about up on service, not just in the UK, or, but also globally on Netflix. Um, and if it's a format, we do like to sort of have the ability to then localize those formats in other countries. So we could do a French version or a Brazilian version with the production company. Um, so our feeling is that that's a great way to help scale for an idea that you have in a format that we know really works. And the truth is, some of the most broadly watched series in the world are reality formats. Uh, Got Talent, Idol, The Voice, um, and so we, we want to help uh, those programmers achieve that as well. Great, okay, so we're gonna come back to the um, UK discussion later, but let's, broadly speaking, is there a common DNA for your shows? That's a good question. The, well, a couple things. I think we are looking for stories that we think will resonate globally, because we are a global network. Um, I think we tend to lean into things that are innovative. You know, we, we want to push the envelope. We, we want to break new ground and try new things and be courageous on that front. Um, and then I think a lot of the stuff that we're doing lately, you could say, falls into the feel-good or positive angle. I think, you know, people sometimes look for a little bit of a respite when they're sitting down and watching television, and, and we certainly love those sorts of shows that put a smile on your face or bring the family closer together. Um, so there's not sort of one answer, but I think taken as a whole, yeah. I mean, we, we want to try to do those best-in-class positive shows that also feel innovative for what we've all been used to seeing on TV. Uh, and of course, everyone in this audience wants to know if there's anything missing on your slate. Uh, there's not, I don't think there's a category that's missing. I think what we want to do is increase our volume. Um, so we have a lot of great shows that have aired already. We have some other great shows we're excited about to come. Um, but as we cover that breadth of unscripted, it's trying to come up with the different variations of those shows. So for food and cooking, we've obviously, we've released uh, Nailed It and Sugar Rush as originals. Um, we've got Great British Bake Off on service. We've had from Australia Zumbo's Just Desserts. Uh, those are sort of great, I'd say smaller type shows. Oh, Bake Off's a big show. Um, and we have a big Master Chef type show coming up later this year as well. Yeah, I was so. just with some American friends watching um, Bake Off in Wyoming, actually, um, on the service. Yeah. So you've been here at Netflix less than two years, and you've had amazing success already. You've led the team that's commissioned Queer Eye, nailed it, as you referred to. My next guest needs no inter introduction. What made those Netflix shows? Why did you commission those? Um, and then how did Queer Eye come about as a reboot again? Sure, I'll start with Queer Eye, um, which I know was... was very well received here in the UK. That Scout Productions, the original producers of, of Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, they came to us and sort of felt like it was time to maybe take another look at, at bringing that show back. And we were 
encouraged sort of by their creative vision. The one request we had is how can we evolve the show? We, we weren't looking to bring back the same show that had been done 10, 15 years prior. Um, and to their credit, they really said, look, it's, it's sort of a different climate right now, but there's still a lot of things that we can touch on. And so the version of the show that we did that I think the reason it was so uh, received so well, we leaned more into sort of the heart and the story. It wasn't just uh, single white men that were being made over. It was sort of the diverse palette of folks that were receiving the love from our new Fab Five uh, and sort of helping them get a new start and lease on life. Um, so that just felt like a way that we could freshen up what had been a really beloved piece of IP, and it turned out well, and I think everybody's been thrilled with how it's been received. Um, sorry, what was the other, the other half uh, of it was? No, I mean, was there um, something that made these Netflix shows? Like... Right. It, it really was coming and saying, let's try to push the genre forward a little bit. Um, you know, Nailed It was a show that we love. I think it's sort of the anti-cooking show. The producers came and, and there's something on Pinterest for those that aren't familiar of Pinterest fails of people trying really complex or ambitious uh, cooking challenges and, and not quite getting there. Uh, so it was a real thing and it, it sort of made us laugh. It felt like we know food and cooking is a, is a potent category globally and this is a very different way. It was, it was a risk for sure. Uh, so it was great to see that the, the bet paid off and that people really uh, enjoyed the, the Yeah, program. I mean, it was a very counterintuitive yes, buy. Yes, it was very counterintuitive. <laughs> um, but I think we need that. You know, there's so much product out there that sometimes you want to mix it up a little bit. And, and I think to have a service that allows that breadth of types of shows is fantastic. And I think that's what brings people back over I mean, and over that's to what's sampling. Why you're, the seat that you sit in is so exciting, because you yeah. can take these risks uh, in a way that nobody else can. So it's... So on that note, how in the world did you get David Letterman to come to Netflix? Uh, he, he, um, he's obviously an amazing piece of talent. He you know, had taken some time off after his late night show, had, had finished its run, and he came to us sort of wanting to explore the idea of, of what could his next project be. And we were thrilled at the prospect of being in business with him and sort of said, well, what's your vision in terms of what you'd like to do? And I think part of what uh, he had felt is that you know he never really took a deeper dive with his interviews on the show and he wanted an opportunity to really meet with uh, interesting dynamic folks and have a much longer conversation with them and we you know try to support our creators in those vision and it felt like a great opportunity for us to work with David. By the way, um, out of curiosity, is there one favorite interview that you have of his that we should all watch? Uh, oh, they're, they're all so different and they're really just they're terrific in their own way. I thought you know, hearing sort of Jay-Z speak um, at length about his career in life was, was fascinating. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, uh, Obama was a, a singular sort of piece of television that we were really proud of, but, but everybody that was in that first run was terrific. Okay, so speaking of the Obamas, you have a big deal with them. Yes. So are you like in the room with Barack Obama all the time? Is he pitching uh, not, you? Not yet, but we are happy to uh, start working with, with him <laughs> and his team to come up with some great programming. You know, Brandon is here right now missing a meeting with the Obamas in Los Angeles, aren't right, you? That's true. This was more important. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, don't say that on the press. <laughs> um, have you had any failures? No. Never. <laughs> At least we, not that he'll admit. That's success, the thing about data. We've had successes of varying degrees. <laughs> no um, data means no failures. No, it's been great. <laughs> okay, um, let's just talk briefly about competition. Like, how do you look at your competition? Are your linear channels your competition? Are other OTT services? Like, how do you view that? We, you know, truthfully, we don't really look at the other OTTs or networks as as competition um, per se. It's really what we're looking for is we're competing with, with members' um, choices and free time and their entertainment choices. So we, we do operate in that world of what is best for our members and what do they want to see, and, and we really don't focus too much at, on what the other OTTs or networks are doing. Um, and I think that's the way that we serve everybody because, we again, we want to have a little bit of everything, um, and you can't do that if you're worrying about what everybody else is doing. Great. Okay, so Brandon's got has brought some amazing clips, some of which are announcements, so he's going to tee up the first one yes. right now. Um, so sort of going back to that earlier question, you know, one, one thing that I love about working at a place like Netflix is that because we're a global network, we really do try to have a very broad global appeal to a lot of the shows, and we're going to show a clip of The Final Table, which is a really big, bold, ambitious swing uh, of a cooking show. 
um, that, that encompasses sort of the world and, and the cuisine around the world. It was done by Robin Ashbrook and Yasmin Shackleton, um, two British showrunners that had previously worked on MasterChef in the US. And we sort of had challenged uh, the community to come up with sort of this grand cooking show concept. And what they delivered on, we were thrilled with, so we're excited to share that here. Okay, let's play the clip. Um, so how did the show come about? How did it get pitched to you? So we, we <laughs> knew that, like I said, we knew that food and cooking was sort of a strong category. Um, and we wanted to take a bold swing and, and the sort of show in that space that only Netflix could really do. Um, and so Robin and Yaz were uh, amongst a small group of producers that sort of had that and they, they came to us and did a magical presentation of celebrating all these different cuisines uh, and pulling it together in a sort of a compelling competition type format. So we, we start with the 24 chefs. I believe more than half had at least one Michelin star and somebody actually got their third Michelin star during taping but didn't want to fly back to receive it because he wanted to stay shooting the competition. Um, and just having that caliber of chef in a competition was something very new. Um, and, and what they make is incredible. It's sort of the competition version of what you'd see on chef's table. Um, so we're excited to, to roll that out. And natural, uh, sort of a natural global show, right? Yeah. 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 Um, okay, let's go on to what everyone really wants to know, which is what are you looking for in a project and how, do we, they, how does everyone in this room pitch you? Good, good question. Um, so there really, there's not sort of one set way. I mean, we, we are looking to do programming from all over the world. Um, I think, you know, having spent half, a, a big chunk of my life in the UK actually, uh, we know that this is the birthplace for some of the most iconic formats and, and has amongst the most creative sort of showrunners and producers out here. Um, and so really it's not, it's not tricky. You know, we have a team of executives that um, are constantly fielding pitches. We get on average probably 40 to 50, 40 to 50 pitches a week. Um, and you know, we, we are trying to cover that breadth of, of category. Um, if you have an agent, that's terrific. It's not mandatory. Um, but obviously the agents sort of help filter through the projects. But you can reach out to, and, and two of our British executives are here, and Sean Hancock and Nat Gruy. Um, they're more than happy to take all your pitches. Um, but wait, be specific about the agent issue because, sure. I mean, w when I was in, when I was commissioning, you had to have an agent to, to protect both right. the buyer and the seller. Yes. Um, and, you know, I think I, in the U.S., the, the agency model is a little more prevalent. In the U.K., I, I don't think it's as sort of frequent or common. Um, and so we, want, we don't want to have that prevent anybody from pitching us. I think, sure, we, we are looking to work with companies that have a track record, that are reputable, that, that certainly have an ability in the sort of space that they're pitching in. Mm -hmm. um, but. That aside, it's really about coming in and finding the best ideas and sort of the best people to work with. Um, so it, it really is as simple as sort of reaching out via email or call and, and sort of inquiring um, as to our appetite around a particular idea. Due to the tonnage of pitches we get, we typically have folks email sort of a log line and some creative materials for us to review. Um, if it's not a fit for whatever reason, will explain why um, to help sort of educate moving forward. And if it is something that we're interested in or sounds promising, we would then set up an in-person pitch or maybe a VC um, to have the producer walk us through it in more detail. Okay, and related to that, what about packaging? Do you care whether, do you want them to come in with their idea and Fully. just the idea or package with a producer you know or? Um, no, it doesn't have to. I mean, you know, the, I think maybe different from some of the U.S. networks, you, you don't need to partner with a U.S. production company. Um, you know, we're here to work directly with you guys. And, you know, we actually have had good success with a lot of U.K. companies that um, we've gone to do projects with, some of which we'll show today. Um, a, a great example is Stellify, uh, which is a fantastic company of really creative executives and producers who came to us with a uh, game show, a physical game show called Flinch. Um, we loved the concept. We worked directly with the Stellify folks. Uh, we shot it in Northern Ireland, um, and we're excited to sort of show that to the world. So it didn't have to be, in that case, sort of a smaller UK-based company partnering with a larger US one. Um, we've also done, uh, and I think we have a clip to show, uh, something we did with Fullwell about the Sunderland Football Club. Um, and that was also another example of, let's work directly with the UK companies. Let's tell a UK story, because we believe it'll resonate not just in the UK, but globally. Um, Shall we go to that clip? Yeah, time? let's show this the is clip. an announcement. Let's yeah. go to Sunderland.
come on, that's a great story. And people are going to love that everywhere in the world, I guarantee you. I did not know Sunderland before we, we commissioned that show. Um, but they did a brilliant job of it. And it shows, like, even if it's a, if it's a team that you, maybe you're not as familiar with, in a town maybe you're not as familiar with, those are human interest stories. That's a passion and a love that you cannot sort of uh, replicate anywhere else. And people respond to that, whether they're in South America or Asia or the US. So I, I just, we couldn't be more excited about that. Um, That's great. So yeah. So, okay, and when you commissioned it, did you do it specifically for the UK market or assume that it was gonna be globally appealing? It, you know, we always start from the lens of, is this something that we think will resonate globally? Um, it doesn't have to. You know, we, we do a lot of sort of what we call local for local or local for regional programming as well. Because again, we have members all over the world and we need to cater to them and to those tastes. But there was something about the Sunderland story that it felt like it touched on sort of those human emotions and elements that transcend language and culture and geography. Um, and so even, you know, if it, if it stays hugely popular in the UK, that's a win. And if it goes beyond the borders, that's also a win. We sort of don't discriminate either way. We just are looking to, pr to bring those stories to life. Um, and how did that show come to you? Um, we, we knew that we <coughs> wanted to get into a little bit more of um, the sports factual side of things, just because sports is, again, a big piece of, of content that, that, that folks respond to. Um, and it was, it was one of those when, when Fulwell came in, they, they had a passion for this team and the team's story. Um, we did think Sunderland might get back into Premier League. That didn't quite go that way. Um, but it was still an amazing journey of, of the story of the town and the club and the people in it. Um, and so we, we uh, were just happy to share it. Uh, and so when, when are we going to get to see this show? That is, I think we have not announced the exact date, but it's uh, end of this year, beginning of next year. Great. Okay, so going back to um, the creative process, so how do you and your team get involved in the creative process? It, it really, it depends, I think, on the project. I mean, we're, we're there to be collaborators, right? I think Netflix prides itself on having lighter touch. You know, we're looking for great stories from really talented storytellers. And you need to let those storytellers and, and the companies sort of do what they do best. So we're there as a resource. I think we can certainly provide context and understanding in terms of our audience and our members. Um, and since we have had a broader sort of global view, it's, it's also helpful, I think, sometimes for us to give that information. And, and that may help shape the story. Um, but for the original commissions, really, it's let's support the, the producer as best we can uh, and guide where we can. But, it, but it's their baby and it's their story. Co-pros, we sort of the same way. We offer to sort of have some creative input. It's always at the end of the day, um, in a tie, we'll always defer to the production company and to the commissioning network um, because it's it's something that we're happy to be part of, but we're not the engine behind it. Um, but but we really, yeah, I think unlike some other places, we, we're not trying to get in the weeds. Um, we we want to just help them realize their vision as best we can. And when you commission, how do you think about number of episodes, whether you want repeatable things or serialized right. shows? Uh, it's really, I think, it's, it's in some ways it's a case-by-case -case basis. I think we're learning a lot as we roll out more and more series as to what works best. Um, you know, I do love the UK model in general of, I, you can tell some great stories in, in sort of a more compact number of episodes, um, and it should only run for as long as you have a real strong creative. Um, but we don't, you know, similar to how we don't put set run times on our episodes or set episode uh, or season episode length, uh, it really is what's best for that show and that story. Uh, I'd say, you know, usually expecting people to sit there for hours on end is probably a lot to ask. Um, so I think it's, it's telling it in a tight and concise way. And then um, what rights do program makers end up giving up or holding or do you take global right. for most of them? No, that's, yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of times when we do the deals, I think this is maybe <clears throat> some, of the, some of the other uh, questions that people have had around, around our structure. For, for any of the shows um, that we commission, we are looking um, to have them sort of be exclusive on Netflix and sort of to be a global exclusive uh, property for original commissions. We provide a premium um, to help offset back end or tape sales um, to compensate for that because we are buying up for the world. Um, we also, on formats, um, in our deals have a format fee. 
which is also to sort of help uh, offset the fact that they might not be selling it piecemeal around the world. Now, I will say on formats, the interesting part is, and we've rolled out a few formats already this year, we're looking to then localize those formats in more than one country. And when we do that, our first sort of stop will always be the originating production company to say, could you do this format in country X? Um, so there's a format fee for that. And even if the, the production company, for whatever reason, can't render those services, they still do get a format fee. So I think in some ways it's an easier one-stop shopping approach um, because you can, you can come to us with a great format and know that we are looking to do that format in a lot of places around the world. Uh, so it's not just a one-off that you're sort of giving up your idea to just have one version of the show. Um, and, we, and we feel like we need to compensate the folks appropriately. I think that's great. Yeah. I'm sure everyone else does here too. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's talk specifically about the UK. You've done a lot of projects in the UK or with UK producers yep. so far. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about those. Um, the, we, we've actually, yeah, we have a, a large <coughs> number. I mean, it, it's uh, <coughs> beyond just the co-pros as well as the original commissions. I know I mentioned Wall to Wall and Full Well, um, Electric Ray. Um, we've had Stellify. We've got um, Two Four. There's, there's, there's a huge number of companies that, that we are in business with or, or looking to be in more business with. Um, but we want to grow that number. <coughs> I think, you know, there, there's some great TV that's being made here as we all know, as this festival is, an, is a testament to. Um, and so it's really about, we want to open the doors and bring more folks into the tent, uh, because I think there's a lot of great stories still to tell. Um, right now, we sort of cover the UK from LA. Uh, Sean and Nat, as I mentioned before, are sort of our, our, our British execs that, that speak most frequently with our UK companies. But they're based in LA. They're based yeah, in LA. I, you know, at a certain point down the road, as we scale increased volume, I could see us having a person in our London office. Um, the documentary team actually has two executives that are moving to the London office to focus on docs for the UK and I believe part of uh, Europe. Um, and we'll see if we follow suit. Yeah. Okay, so why don't we, I mean, you also are involved with British talent. So we are. this is an, another uh, tape that you brought with yes. us. Yes. Um, so when I first got to Netflix and we were trying to figure out what, what will work sort of internationally, I thought, Maybe, maybe something with magic, right? Which, you know, magic has sort of had a resurgence on got talent in the last couple seasons, but a trick is a trick in any language. Um, and so we sort of really actively went out and looked for some magic-based shows, and we found uh, sort of three different swings that we were taking, one of which has premiered already in, in called Magic for Humans with an American magician. We also have a special coming up with Darren Brown, uh, who I know is hugely popular here, that we're excited about doing that, that will come up in the fall. Uh, and then DMC, Drum and Money Coots, uh, is a well-known magician, and, and he came to us with a really compelling concept of doing a global version of a magic show. So uh, we sort of jumped on that opportunity to work with DMC, and we have, I think, a trailer to show uh, that's a sneak peek at this. Okay, so let's look at DMC. Cool. Um, how did you find DMC? Uh, he, found, he found us. I, you know, it, it's, he, he actually, in that case, he partnered with um, uh, one of the companies that's part of Tenopolis. And, and they came in sort of because we put the remit out of saying, look, we'd love to find something in the magic space. Uh, I wasn't familiar with him before. He was just sort of fantastic to meet in the room. And, and I think, again, it, it was one of those angles in that it wasn't just, I'm going to come out and do some, some tricks. And, and some illusions, but there was a narrative to it, right? He wanted to explore the story of infamous tricks where it had gone wrong and the magician um, had, had died during it. And sort of, it was a part storytelling in terms of a history lesson and also allowing him to update and sort of do his brand of magic. And then I think he's just a very captivating, charismatic um, personality in his own right. And again, it, it, we sent him all around the world. Um, I don't think he knew what he was signing up for when we agreed to do it. But we got to go to some amazing places. They shot it in a really stunningly beautiful way. And again, what he tries and does in the show really does push, I think, the boundaries of what we've seen in other magic shows. Yeah, so we're, yeah. It's, I mean, because I'd never seen him before, so it was yeah. a great discovery, great. I think. So related to that, so, sort of broadly speaking, how do you and your team track um, talent across the globe or find 
talent? We work, you know, we, we, we try to stay as up-to-date as we can on sort of all the different markets. We have, obviously, Netflix as a company has sort of marketing teams and um, uh, social teams in, in many, many different regions and territories. And so we stay in constant contact with them and dialogue with them about sort of what's going on from a programming perspective in those markets and then some of the talent that are bubbling to the surface. But really, it's again, and you know, I, people have been, have come to us with sometimes talent that we're not as familiar with, and we want to give everybody a shot. You know, we don't, we don't have a brand that defines the shows. It's the shows that we have that sort of define what we do. Um, and and it's, we want to, to be as wide and encompassing as we can. And so when we find a piece of talent, even if we're not familiar with them, but we think they're great, let's take a shot. Let's do the show with them. If it's, you know, if it's, a, if it's a production company that maybe we, for whatever reason, are not as familiar with, but they've got a great track record or they've done a lot of shows of a certain type that, that they're now pitching us, let's take a shot. Let's work with them. Um, that's really what we're about because I think we can't be, we have to remain open-minded because there, there are so many stories and great talent to work with out there globally that we need to foster more of that comfort with them coming to so us. So thinking about things globally, does it have to be English language or have you done... Local. No, it does not have to be English language. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a little bit maybe like Sunderland, if, if that equivalent had come to us um, in India or in Brazil, we would be just as intrigued and interested in doing that. You know, we have membership in 190 countries, and we need to find shows that aren't just one size fits all, and we need to tell shows that sort of reflect the people in that country as well. And that, again, is just as valuable to us as something that maybe resonates on a more global basis. Um, but it's incumbent on us to go out and, like, and meet those producers and find those ideas and, and be a place where those people can also come to us um, to get their shows and visions sort of realized. Great. OK, so your last clip, I'm a huge Formula One fan, so I'm excited about this clip. So Great. why don't you sort of lay out what the show is? Yeah. Um, it's, it's something we had, we had mentioned earlier in the year, but um, again, going back to what are sort of global areas, Formula One is obviously a premier global brand and sports league. Um, they were interested in, I think, taking a deeper dive into what the league is, the story of the drivers, the people that make up Formula One. Um, and we were fortunate enough to sort of be able to, to work with them and with some really talented filmmakers. James Gay Reese is there, box to box. Um, and it's a, it's a real never before seen look behind the curtain of Formula One. Um, it's, we follow them all around the world. We have a very diverse cast of global superstars and the drivers. Um, and it feels like it sort of checks that box of something that is so epic and scale in nature that it sort of fits with what we're doing on the Netflix uh, uh, service. Great, so let's take a look at that one. So when do I get to see this show? Uh, we are looking right now to premiere that uh, a little bit before the upcoming season, uh, the next season. Next so, season, okay. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting that you've commissioned two sports-related shows that are not at all American appeal or U.S. appealing. Right. Um, very much non-U.S. actually. Yeah, and I, think, and I think that's really what, you know, part of the beauty of, of how Netflix operates and views itself. It's, you know, we can be a U.S. company, but we are a global network. Um, and it's, it is, again, I think our responsibility, and we pride ourselves on this, on looking well beyond the borders of the U.S. to find um, interesting programming for our members. Uh, and so far, it's, again, it's been a fantastic start. We have a long ways to go in terms of building up the unscripted slate even more, um, but we're up for the challenge and, and really just are invigorated about the opportunity that's ahead of us um, in doing that. And then, so we'll get to see all 10 parts of that show but not all of your shows get put on the service at, all at once. Right, the, so, I mean, the, the traditional model, I'd say the vast majority of the time is sort of that binge release. We have had some exceptions. David Letterman's uh, uh, series was one a month. Um, and we've, we've talked about, you know, one of the unknowns is I think on a lot of these big arc serialized shows, particularly the competition shows, you know, in linear, there's a lot of chatter as you roll them out, sort of one, one a week. Um, I think we're going to see whether we maintain the binge model for those sorts of shows, or is, is there a potential for trying something that's rolled out in maybe a little bit more of a deliberate fashion? Um, but right now, we're very happy with that binge release. Uh, I, I do think if, if we all do our jobs and, and make compelling episodes within that sort of arced uh, serialization, people won't want to shortcut and jump to the end. Uh, people are 
happy and entitled to do that, but I think if we can tell compelling stories in every episode, you'll stick through it and, and, and want to watch all of it through to the finale. Great. And then uh, before we go to questions, just one more uh, question around data. I think that's a big mystifying thing is, do you share, like how do we know as, a, as producers whether we're successful on Netflix or not? And, and yeah, no, I think that's a fair question. We, I mean, look, there, there's, we, we have been giving more transparency, I will say, to the creators and to the showrunners on, um, on the programming front. Um, I think that's just an effort to, to, to share with them in terms of in the success. Because, you know, one distinction is there are shows that hit the zeitgeist and people talk about and, and, and buzz about, you know, things like Queer Eye, things like Nailed It. And those shows are great shows and, and we're proud of them and they do very well. And then there are many, many shows that also do equally well that maybe aren't spoken about as much from a critical perspective or, or maybe you know, from a social media perspective. Um, but the producers, I think, they see the results when, when they get a show on Netflix. Like they are getting it through many other channels um, in terms of the impact and resonance that the show will have. Um, so I think it's one of those areas that we're still fine tuning a little bit, but I think we've been more transparent in terms of sharing that stuff recently. Great, so I'm gonna start with some questions that have been, come through the app from the audience. Um, so one of the questions from the audience is, um, what shows on other networks do you wish were on Netflix? <laughs> oh. um, I, I, don't, I don't know if there's, if there's another show. I think that's a very tricky question. I think there's shows we certainly take inspiration from. Um, you know, when I was at NBC, we did the US version of First Dates, which is a format and a show I love, and I think is brilliantly done here. Um, that would have been a great show to have on Netflix. I think, you know, it's, it's again, it's a content matter in terms of dating and love that sort of translates all over the world. Um, in the US, it, it, was, it was a really good show, but I think there was something special about the UK version. Um, but there, there, there's, you know, shows, I think we look at the other shows sometimes and go, that's great storytelling, that's a great idea, you know, what's our version of that? Um, and sort of go from there, but there's not, there's not necessarily a show that I'd say, let's, let's put that on Netflix right now. Okay. Um, another question is, how important are taster tapes in pitching to you? Those are, it's, I think all of that stuff is helpful. Um, you know, because typically, and actually I'll use this as sort of a segue to, to talking again about some of the process in terms of pitching us, um, you know, as robust of a presentation as you can come to us with, it's, it's very much appreciated. Um, certainly, I think at a minimum, we'd love to have that creative deck that lays out the vision for the show over the course of the season or certainly, you know, within the episodes. Um, I think tape goes further and I think shows us a little bit clearer way of what your vision is for the show and gives us a better sense of it. Um, so that stuff is always very helpful. Um, we have, you know, typically Netflix, we go straight to series. I think there are times when you want to dial in and get the show just right. And so we have actually for Unscripted implemented a process of seeding out some development money to sort of flesh out an idea. Um, we've done that on some formats. Uh, the majority of the ones that we've done it on have been for factual series. And mainly that's to sort of get a proof of concept of the cast, in the characters in that world, and see if that alchemy is there that, that we think exists. So far, we've done that for six different projects. All six have gone to series, and I think all six have benefited from that sort of like extra step before we committed to the full series. So like, did you do a taster on Sunderland to, to get a sense? That we did, we just believed in that. Wow. So we went straight, we went straight to that. Um, I think we had a little bit of tape of sort of the passion of the city, um, but no, that was one that we felt good about, so we went, we went right with it. Okay, so there still seems to be some um, mystification in the audience around pitching to you. Okay. So could you be more specific about if someone has an idea, how do they approach you? Um, sure. The, I think, honestly, the simplest way, um, if you haven't worked with us before or, or you don't sort of have, or you're not maybe part of a, a larger company that, that has sort of a relationship with Netflix already is, it's, it's, it's as simple as emailing Sean or Nat or one of our programming executives. Um, and if you have an agent, obviously having that agent facilitate that introduction. But there, there's no, it's not complex. It, it, it's fairly straightforward in, in that sense. Um, and that at least helps us initiate that relationship. Um, help us get to know you better. Like help us understand what you've done, where you're coming from, um, and then we can sort of walk through more of the details. It, it might be sort of a submission release form um, 
if it's somebody we haven't worked with before, maybe doesn't have representation, but it, it's pretty simple and straightforward. I, I, I know that sounds crazy uh, with, with sort of how um, maybe it's been viewed before getting into Netflix, but, but it is as straightforward as that. So going back to data a little bit, what are your benchmarks for success? Is it about hitting different pockets of people or less churn on the service, or how, how do you look at that? Um, it's, it's really about are we coming up with something unique that will engage whatever amount of our viewers that, that we're trying to sort of service that appetite uh, or that interest. Um, I mean, I think certain things are obviously bigger category swings than others, but it's, it's well-told, interesting subject matter. At the end of the day, we'll always win. Um, and we aren't programming to one specific demographic or group. It really is like, let's showcase the diversity in the world and the diversity of tastes around the world with our membership. Um, so there's no such thing as a wrong idea. It, it could be duplicative for something we have, and maybe it doesn't make sense to double down at that point. Um, or it could be something that uh, maybe fits better into a documentary approach, so it's, it's a better fit for the docs team. Um, but again, it's, it's the dialogue that we want to have with the community, with you guys, in terms of saying, here's what we think it will work and why, or here's something that isn't quite the right fit, at least right now, and why that is. Um, and that allows you guys to be more efficient with your time and your development, and come back to us with something that hopefully will be a better fit and allow us to work together moving forward. Uh, one other question. Let's see. What, what are your plans for expanding in the talk show space? Talk is, um, you know, it's a, it's a great area. We know that it works. Um, we've had some sort of what we call talk and conversation shows so far this year, uh, and we still have uh, a few more to come. We're trying to cover the spectrum of talk type shows. Uh, there's a panel show with Jimmy Carr that is uh, debuting later this year. We have um, a celebrity interview show with Norm MacDonald. Um, we have a really big sort of swing with Hassan Minaj who is a correspondent on The Daily Show, and he has sort of a unique take on a uh, topical type uh, talk show. So we're going we're gonna to roll those out and sort of see what resonates the most with the members um, and sort of continue down that path. Great. OK, so um, Stellify is near and dear to my heart. And there's a question here. Is, are, um, what was it that appealed to you about Flinch? It was, you know, one of the things we'd said about game shows, um, because sort of we have this, you know, this global audience is that are there sort of non-trivia game shows? You know, we were toying around in that area of, you know, what is something that will, people will respond to even if they don't uh, necessarily know the history of a particular country. So, so trivia-based stuff seemed maybe a tougher sell. Um, and so we love sort of comedy and, 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 and physical fun sort of concepts. And the guys, the lads came up with a great sizzle piece uh, of, of a really interesting idea. And really, the, the idea was we're going to put uh, these contestants in some crazy scenarios, and they just have to not flinch. And they can <laughs> win money, or they can win you know, uh, uh, points. And it was that, it was that simple of, a, of an idea, but the, the comedy they infused in the tape and in the deck in terms of what their vision was really sold us on it. Um, and we didn't want to lose the magic of that they shot it in a barn in Northern Ireland. And I think, you know, it was one of those, it just felt like the right look and the vibe. And so when we commissioned it, we said, let's stick in Northern Ireland. Let's, let's go all the way. And uh, we've got some great UK hosts in there, uh, all UK contestants. Who's hosting it? Um, it's, it there's, there's, you promise, there's, two Briti yeah, there's two British comedians and, and, actually, and then an American comedian that lives in London. Um, I remember seeing that taster. It's a great. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. We're excited so to roll So when it does that come to the service? That's going to come on later this year. OK. Yeah. OK, another question. Um, are there other key territories for you in Europe? They're really, they're all key territories. We, you know, we don't, we don't discriminate. I mean, it's, we, we want to find great local programming and sort of, and obviously global programming, but for local programming in sort of every country that we're currently in. Um, you know, I think it's a great way, Europe in general, there's so many diverse sort of tastes and programming types. Um, so we really need to do a good job of figuring out what are the best sorts of shows to show in France and Spain and Italy and Germany, uh, in the UK, obviously. Um, and it's just, I think, we'll know it when we see it and as we get more educated and smarter about uh, what's been working on TV there. Okay, this is a really important question for everyone in the audience is, do you cash flow productions? Yes, we do cash flow productions. Um, we, you know, 
we get it, especially I think with the, some of the smaller production companies, uh, that that's a big part of the question. So we absolutely do cash flow, you know, the development stuff I talked about previously, and then on the co-pro model, you know, giving the extra funds uh, to help sort of, uh, achieve the vision that you have for your series. Um, but the cash flowing does, I think, help, and it's, you know, again, it's just us being creator friendly and wanting to, to not turn anybody away, but to bring people into the tent. So Meaning upfront, meaning so it's yeah. different from the drama side, where at least in the, as we dealt with Netflix and drama, we had to cash flow the whole thing in advance. Okay, that's yeah. not the case. Okay. No, we, no, it's we, important for this. Yeah, audience. no, we yeah. cash flow. It's it's not all the money upfront. Um, it's we sort of section it out um, according to the various steps. But for sure, we we want to be there with you guys and and sort of fund it so that we're we're getting the production value and the execution that we need along the way. Okay, another question that uh, a number of people in the audience want to know is, do you fully fund always, or have you worked with brands and other potential funders? No, that's a great question. We, yes, we do fully fund. Um, I think we're still exploring that relationship with probably what, we, you know, in the US, and we talk about sponsor partners or integrations. Um, we've been more receptive to that. You know, I think we don't need, you know, need that element uh, to buy a show. I think we're open to it when it makes sense. Um, in certain shows, we've had partners. But I do think one of the brand propositions about Netflix for its members is that you're not getting commercials and you're not being um, presented or pushed something within the program that feels obvious or sort of not organic to what the show is. Um, you know, Queer Eye was terrific in that we didn't necessarily have brand partners, but we had a lot of companies that wanted to participate in some of the makeovers, whether it was for our heroes in the show or for sort of the homes that we were making over. Um, and that's sort of a different dialogue. But no, we, we are looking to fund it 100%. Um, and again, just do what's best for the show. Great. And then how do you look at um, program length? Like, are you interested in shorter form content? Yeah, we, we definitely are. We've, we've experimented so far with a couple of shorter form shows. Um, you know, they can be whatever is the best length for it. I think, you know, when you talk about short form and you talk about 10 to 15 minute episodes, yes, we, we are certainly receptive and open to that if, again, if we love the creative. Um, but it also goes back to what's best for the show. You know, some episodes might be 35 minutes, some episodes might be 52 minutes. I think it, it's, it, it comes down to the conversation of how do you service the story best and, and not feel constrained by any restrictions that you might have elsewhere. Um, so shorter, longer, it, 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 it just matters at its best for what, for what the show is. And how about diversity? How do you look at uh, diversity in front of and behind the camera? Uh, it, is a huge, it is a huge thing for us. It's a huge thing for me personally, um, having sort of grown up living around the world. Um, it, it's a responsibility we take very seriously, and, and also we, we want to do it. You know, I think the best thing, as we all know about Unscripted, is that it's really a reflection of the people that are out there. And so we would be irresponsible if we weren't showcasing what the world is. And the world is diverse. And I think we need to show those stories of diverse stories in terms of the people on camera, the types of stories that you're telling. And you do that obviously by covering diverse subject matter, but also having storytellers behind the camera that have a story to tell and that know something that they want to get out there and share with the world. And again, we have a service that allows for that. So we are pushing very hard. I, I'm proud of the job we've done. I think we've got a great lineup of both diverse talent in front of the camera and diverse talent behind the camera, but there's still much more we can do and we will do. Um, and, and, and as it grows, I think it'll just become Hopefully, it gets to the point where nobody asks about whether you're doing diversity. It just is a thing that we are all doing together. Um, I mean, you look in the room, and it's diverse faces out there. We, we need more of that, and I think, again, Unscripted occupies a unique role and place in being able to turn that around and, and do that effectively. Yeah, I agree completely. Yeah. Um, what's your appetite for more traditional factual, like science and history? Uh, we're, we're, again, for sure open to that. Um, I think I would challenge you know, all of you that when you're coming with sort of the traditional stuff, it's what's your twist or what's a way to evolve it or, or update it. Um, but those categories are absolutely things that we're interested in. Um, I think depending on the subject matter, again, it, is it more of a documentary approach? Then we would certainly point you to our docs team. Um, but we're looking for those, for those uh, factual categories as well. Um, and then the last question, because we're running out of time now. Well, it's two questions, actually. Do you offer development, development money to people? 
And then uh, would you do more lifestyle and features in the UK, out of the UK? Uh, short answer to both is yes. Um, so yes, we obviously, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we, we've done development steps um, and funded money for that, and we've had good success with it. Again, we, we're always looking to go straight to series, but I think sometimes it helps the process and helps the project if we sort of get our feet under our, a little bit uh, in the beginning with sort of that half step. Um, and then, yeah, lifestyle stuff, absolutely. Um, you know, we've got some on service already. Would we look for some op opportunities that are more UK-centric in the lifestyle space? Yes, for sure. We have a huge audience out here. We want to cater to them. And if there's a great show that falls within that space, we would do it in a heartbeat. And is there anything else you want to say to this audience before we close this? Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, hopefully this has demystified some of what uh, Netflix Unscripted uh, team is doing. Um, and we just look forward, honestly, to engaging with everybody here. And let's get more shows from UK showrunners. Let's get more shows you know, globally together. Uh, and we think we can be hopefully the best partners for you guys. So I mean, this is you. music to this group to ears. Thank you. And honestly, it's a it's a great uh, honor and pleasure to have you here, and it's been great fun to chat with you. Thanks, Andrea. So you thank too. you, Brandon. Thanks, guys.